Words of Christ, part of the Last Supper discourse. John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no man comes to the Father but through me. Amen. Father in heaven, please bless us as we seek to understand and apply this text to your glory and our growth in grace. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, as I've already intimated, I'm inviting you this morning to look intently at one of these great I am statements made by Jesus Christ, of which he made seven, and in particular this one where he calls himself the way and the truth and the life, and looking especially and particularly at what it means when he said, I am the way. I think this is a stupendous claim, that's an opinion of mine, uh, I think it's one that, with which there's much agreement, when he says, I am the way. I think in our linguistically careless culture, and where grammatical precision is more often sneered at than appreciated, the careful use of grammatical and linguistic rules of order and use can be a blessing is not often appreciated. But the use of the definite article matters. And when Jesus Christ said, I am the way, he was making a claim that is staggering. He was claiming to be, in his essence, something. The verb to be is the verb of essence. I think we're often unwittingly able to exhibit a deficiency of appreciating the power of essence, the verb to be, when somebody says, for instance, what are you? And a person may say, well, I'm a carpenter. That is consummate theological an anthropological nonsense. I am not a farmer or a carpenter or a physician. That is my occupation or calling. What I am is a human being made in the image of God with a fallen nature, either redeemed by the grace of the Lord God and the Lord Jesus Christ or not. That's what I am. And if I am redeemed by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm under an obligation to live for him, through him, and by him. That's my essence, as either a redeemed or unredeemed sinner. That's what the word, the verb, to be, refers to. So when Christ says, I am, and then whatever it is that he adds, that's a claim to be inseparably connected to, involved with, and integrated with the essence of what he's claimed, following the I am. And in our text this morning, it's three elements, the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way to the Father. He is the truth and the only truth that leads to eternal life. And he is the life, the eternal life. There is no other. So these are powerful claims, and I want to propose to you that John 14, 6 
is one of the most hated verses in liberal and atheistic and unbelieving circles. If you have a sense of our culture, there are almost no, and I'll use this, what has become a catchword, value. There's almost no values left that aren't challenged. Such things as marriage being a union of one man and one woman and so on. These are values that have just been cast aside with increasing frequency. But there's one unadmitted value that with one notable exception is just clung to, and that's the value of tolerance in our culture society. We are expected to tolerate everything, are we not? And if we object to anything, we're subject to being identified as hate mongers or hate speakers. So here is a text that is intolerant. I am the way clearly indicates an exclusion of all other ways. And it is a hated text in secular circles. And it's one of the first texts that was overtly objected to by theological liberalism that crept into the Protestant churches in this country beginning in the mid-1800s and, of course, accelerated to the worst excesses in the 1930s and 20s and 30s. Now, this idea of the way I've already suggested is biblical, but I want to take you to two texts of the Old Testament and a few of the New to reflect how common and how powerful this use is. And the first is in Genesis 3. Genesis 3, verse 24. So he, that is God, drove the man out, that's out of the garden, and in the east of the garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction, to guard the way to the tree of life. So at the very beginning of the human race, this idea of a way is become, has become normative. And then there's one other that I trust is very familiar to you, and that's in Isaiah 53. All us like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned unto his own way. That's in Isaiah 53, 6. But in the New Testament, we find, and I, by the way, I could have picked many, many texts from the Old Testament, so those are just two that are representative, but I think uh, well encompass the essence of that concept. Matthew chapter 2. As the New Testament begins, the subject of the way again appears Matthew 2.12, speaking of the three magi who had come to honor Christ. Matthew 2.12, And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their own country by another way. Now that's in its most simple, obvious sense. The idea of another road, another journey. But then we see the... Uh, idea picked up in a much broader and more profound sense in Matthew 3, reading from verse 1. Now in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Make ready the way of the Lord. And so the use of the idea of way with a very specific theological focus, a very specific theocentric focus, is common throughout the Old and the New Testament. Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20 and verse 21. And they questioned him, saying, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly, and you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. Here are the 
scribes and the Pharisees, for all of their hatred, recognized what he was doing, teaching the way of God, and admitted that begrudgingly. But it's interesting that they use that term as one of the um, Pharisee group, the scribes, acknowledged Christ's integrity in teaching the way. And then we see an uh, application of this idea of the way in Acts 9, verses 1 and 2, where we're told that the Christians had begun to be called the people of, here it comes, the way, quote, close quote. So profound is this term, rightly understood, that it can be used to describe the very essence of the kingdom of God in its gospel presentation. Romans 3, beginning with verse 16. Destruction and misery are in their paths. This is that great passage quoting from the Old Testament from Psalms about there's none righteous, no, not one. And the way of peace or the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And so Paul picks up on that as one of the descriptive texts in his great work in Romans of the way of those who are unbelievers. And then a powerful one in Hebrews, which is a wonderful book in terms of understanding the administration of the new covenant in Hebrews 10, Verse 19 and following. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, do you believe we have confidence to enter into the very presence of God the Father covered by the blood of Christ and the righteousness of Christ? Do you believe that? Because that's the holy place he's talking about that we're able to enter into. We have confidence to enter into the holy place by the blood of Christ by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. By his death he inaugurated a new way to come into the presence of Almighty God. Beautiful use of that term way. And then a couple of final ones. James chapter 1 verse 18 me a minute. I was, thought I was in James. I was still in Hebrews. In the exercise of his will, this is James 1.18, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we might be, as it were, the first fruits among his creatures. And then finally, 2 Peter chapter 2 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there also will be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even demonstrating the master who, even denying the master who brought them, bringing them upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. The way of the truth. Interesting use of the word, but the idea, again, of a, of a whole character, a lifestyle, a whole way of behaving, uh, focused expressly and particularly upon objection to the truth. So as we move into this, looking at this text more closely, I want to encourage you that by way of application, we don't simply respond intellectually, but also with our heart. Every one of us in this building and every person we know already has a way. Even a newborn baby quickly begins to illustrate 
one of several ways that babies express their personality. Some babies are fussy, are they not? Some babies are cheerful and peaceful and contented. That's a different way for a baby to, to live and respond and move. So every one of us has a way, and I don't know if you've ever asked your question, this question of yourself, what is my way in terms of how I see it, and what do others think my way is? Because we each have a way that reveals in profound measure our spiritual essence. As surely as Christ reflecting on his own essence with the preliminary phrase, the to be verb of I am the way. So if you look for a minute in John 8, 58, we see an example of this use of I am other than the one we're looking at. John 8. John 8, 57. Jesus, the Jews therefore said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Adam, not you have seen Abraham. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, comma, I am. When Moses saw the burning bush and was drawn to it and told to take off his shoes or his sandals for the ground where he was standing, did so and bowed before the presence of the angel of the Lord, which we believe is a new t an Old Testament expression of Christ speaking to the church. When Moses said, what is your name? The answer was, I am who I am. In other words, my essence is so unique and so glorious and so above every way of man that the only way I can be, in one sense, properly named in a way that is sufficient for my glory is to identify myself by myself. I am who I am or I am what I am. So as we look at our passage in John 6, or John 14, verse 6, the use of the term by Christ implies and claims deity. When he says, I am, he is claiming divine essence. He's claiming to be God. And so as we start looking at this text and unpassing it, unpacking it, we have to acknowledge that we're looking at a text in which he revealed three, well, really four ways you could say it, of looking at his very essence as a redeemer, as Lord, as king. Jesus said that we have to know him if we would be indeed validated as genuine believers, genuine professors of faith. And one of the most solemn warnings at the end of his introductory sermon, Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, is he will say to those that are wicked but were uh, participants in outward churchly activity who will say, Lord, didn't we do this and do that? And he will say, depart from me, you wicked. I never knew you. And so we're talking about knowing Jesus Christ in a marvelous sense. If this, the Spirit gives us the grace to embrace this and apply it richly. So Christ gives us much guidance in the idea of the way. In Luke 1, verse 79, we see a reference to Christ in the way that's not expressed as Christ expressed it in John 14, but related to Christ. Luke chapter 1. Verse 79. I'm going to read a little bit before that in this great prophecy of Zacharias. And beginning uh, 
with verse 76. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you go on, you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God with, with which the sunrise from on high shall visit us, to shine upon us, to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. And then he ends that great quote from the Old Testament with an inspired declaration to guide our feet into the way of peace. So Christ is a guide to the peace of God. He's a guide to the way of God. And then in Luke 20, we see another aspect of that. Luke 20, verse 21, if my writing is correct. Well, I can't read my own notes in that connection, so we just have to let it go as a great mystery. And then as we already read in, in um, Hebrews 10, verse 20, he has inaugurated a new and living way. So those are responses to the idea of way, the way of God, the way of righteousness, so on. But in the end, he encapsulates all of that under the umbrella of the declaration, extremely brief and totally profound. None of us can fully appreciate its depth and its profundity fully, and that is, I am the way. And then it bears out in three particular ways. The first is he says, as I am the way, he then begins to qualify the focus he wants the disciples to have. And the first is, I am the truth. And Jesus Christ is the truth made flesh. We know that. He's the truth incarnate. And beginning in the uh, first chapter of John, he is the word, described as the word. Christ said in John 17, 17, thy word is truth. So he equates the word of God with truth. And then if you look at John 8, there's a very interesting equation that Christ draws, beginning in verse 31. Jesus, therefore, was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, then are you truly disciples of mine. Notice, abide in my word. And if you do that and are a true disciple, then you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And then he goes on to say in verse 36, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. So the freedom that he speaks of from the truth is identical to the freedom that he himself provides as the truth incarnate. So you see again how he links these ideas together, interweaves them like golden threads in a beautiful tapestry they come out in various ways. And so Jesus Christ claims to be the truth in its essence is one of the aspects of understanding that broad overall arching comment and claim of being the way to God. And then the life, well in John 1 and verse 4 we have one of the very first concepts of Christ's infidence introduced as the, as the light. John 1 beginning with verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the word, word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by Him, and apart from Him nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life. And then there's more, of course, but I wanted to stop there. There's again a distinct, absolute claim that life is in Jesus Christ and that all things came into being, things including the living beings. And in God, of course, we live and move and have our being. So our essence of existence is just physical beings and even the animals depends upon Christ's specific creative prerogatives 
and giving life. So he says, I am the way, the truth, and then he says, the life. Of course, that definite article narrows it immediately to eternal life, or if you will, spiritual life. And so the three I am's then have a focus that is t supremely narrow. No man comes to the Father but through or by me. That all of these great declarative I am's in the end focus on the exclusivity of the door of mercy leading to the Father in heaven and access to him. So there's a necessary conclusion that any and all who desire eternal life are absolutely and only able to find it in Christ and through Christ, who saves to bring redeemed sinners into the congregation of worshipers who will worship God the Father and himself for eternity. So we're looking at a concept that has eternal consequences for everyone who either regards it or disregards it. Now, there's an element here that I want to point out that is crucial. And again, I want to give a moment's background in history that one of the primary driving motives in the liberalism that began in the mid-1800s was to disclaim the teaching of Scripture, to dishonor and to remove the idea that there's hell, there's consequences for sin. And that was expressed in several ways. A God of love would not send people to hell. Another way it was expressed to the common folks was the Old Testament has a God of judgment, but the New Testament has a God of love, as if somehow God were transmogrified. But those kinds of godless heretical platitudes were often embraced by shallow thinkers. And so we have here a text that contains an unpleasant warning. And there comes in two ways, indirectly and directly. There's two classes of warnings, explicit and implicit. There's warnings that are very tightly expressed, repent and believe, or you will not receive eternal life. That's an explicit warning. But an indirect warning is one that comes by looking at a claim and de deducting from that claim a consequence which, if it's disregarded, is serious. And Christ had many of those. And so looking at a few of them, I think a good one to start with is looking at Luke chapter 9. Luke 9. Verse 6. And departing, departing, they began going about among the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. And that is clearly not the, the text I had intended. Uh, Luke 13, let's see if I got that one right. Luke 13, verse 23 and following. And someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter by the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Would you agree that that's a warning? Is that a serious warning? I think it is. Do you believe that Matthew 7 Verses 13 and 14 are a serious warning. Matthew 7, verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are those who enter by it. Because, is a proper translation where often it's said for, because is an equivalent translation. I'll read it that way. Because the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are those who find it. 
Now, if you understand the, the second verse there, verse 14, is seen as a cause of what's described in verse 13, we can put that in different terms, that the narrowness of the narrow way, the narrow way is so narrow that it's offensive to the majority of mankind. The narrowness of Christ's way is offensive to the unbelieving, unregenerate were part of, the, of society. From the dawn of human history, men kick against the goad, against God's way. And so, if you look at something like Revelation 3, there's a warning there at the very end of Scripture. Christ is in heaven. It's the final book of the Bible. And yet, there's still a warning. Revelation chapter 3. And it's powerful. Verse 16 and following. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire, that you may become rich and white, and white garments, that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness may be revealed, and I salve to see, or to anoint your eyes that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Brothers and sisters in Christ, is that a warning? Is that an admonition that's solemn and serious? So, beginning with the curse in the Garden of Eden laid upon Adam and Eve, to the very end of the Bible, this idea of warnings is important. Now, there's an element that I want to address by way of uh, application that's crucial. Proverbs 14, verse 12 gives us a, a snapshot of this where Solomon says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end thereof is the way of death. I have the, pos the potential to be fully convinced my way is right, and if you'll accept the pun, be dead wrong. We have that capacity to deceive ourselves, as Jeremiah says. Our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And then he asks the rhetorical question, who can know it? And the obvious expected answer is nobody. We don't know it. The depths of the depravity of our own heart, even after we're saved. And so, in looking at this text, where Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, we need to appreciate the fact that we have an intrinsic, automatic pilot response to reject what God says as truth. And let me show you two examples that I think are breathtaking. Both of them, I trust, are familiar. The first is in Matthew 16. In Matthew 16, Christ asks his apostles a question. Who do you think I am? And I trust you all know the great honor, the, the, uh, the great answer that Peter gave to Jesus. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Remember that? And then he begins to talk to them about something else. Verse 21, Matthew 16. From, this, from that time, Jesus Christ began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Now, he had been doing that for a good part of his public ministry. And look at Peter's response. Peter, who has just made this glorious confession by the grace of Almighty God the Father, giving him the eyes to see that and understand it. Peter says to him, 
and begins to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. One of the most, in my opinion, terrifying rebukes ever received by a known believer. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind or savoring God's interests, but man's. So what I want to try to get across, however feebly, is that even amongst believers, we need to recognize we have an instinctive tendency to reject what we don't already see if it's from God and it contradicts in however mild a way what we ourselves think is right. And then, as if that weren't sufficient, in terms of the capacity that we have to deny God's information, God's truth, look at Luke 16. Luke chapter 16 contains the account, and I strongly encourage you not to call it a parable, but the account of the rich man and Lazarus. Now, why do I say don't call it a parable? Because for starters, it names a particular individual. And secondly, it's making a claim that only Christ could fulfill of recording and transmitting or reporting a conversation from the bowels of hell. And that's, of course, what the rich man in heaven said, I mean in hell says. So beginning with verse 27, and he said, after being refused that by Abraham to let Lazarus come with a drop of water on his fingertip to cool the rich man's tongue, he then says, I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. He's grasped the fact there's a divide that can't be crossed. Abraham cannot send Lazarus into hell for an, on a mission of mercy. There is no mercy in hell. So maybe for the first time in his life, the rich man begins to think about somebody else besides himself. And he says, I have five brothers, that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham. For those of you that have raised children, what's one of the first words that little ones learn? What's one of the first words, the two-letter N word? No. Sometimes they get it by the time they're six months or even earlier. That's just part and parcel, the woof and warp of our very being and essence is encapsulated in that. And he looks up at Abraham who said, no, it can't happen. And he says, no, Father Abraham, but if somebody goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And Abraham lays out a great evangelical truth that if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they do not listen to the scripture, neither will they be persuaded if somebody rises from the dead. God's ways are not our ways. And so for the sensitive person who desires to walk in the grace of God and to walk in the way of Christ, we need to be aware that there is a battle going on and it should be going on every day between the flesh and the spirit. There's a warfare going on if we're in Christ's way. It's been between what remains of the old man and what is under the lordship of Christ as the new man. So any way that isn't specifically, explicitly, carefully, and narrowly Christ's way constitutes our own way and is the way of death. It's the way of death. And the parable of the wheat and the tares and many other warnings in Scripture point out that it is possible to be a member of a Bible-believing church and never, ever embrace and understand and submit to and love and obey and apply Christ's way. A couple of final thoughts. 
I suggested this earlier, I'll suggest it again. Be prepared for pushback if you are faithful in witnessing to the way. If you are faithful in testifying to the way, sooner or later you will meet pushback. Because by the very fact of embracing John 14, 6, that one verse, whether you think of it this way or not, you have clearly declared yourself to be in opposition to the culture that we live in in this country. Because the rejection of Christ as the way has covered innumerable fronts. I couldn't name all the ways that people in American society, and it's true around the world, of course, I'm not just limiting it to the United States, but have rejected the way that is in and of itself the person and work of Jesus Christ. So, do you and I love the way? Is the way on our heart? Well, let me take you to one verse in the Psalms that is often poorly quoted. Psalm 14. Your Bible, unless it's a King James, and I think this is true of the New King James, but I could be wrong, I've forgotten. Verse 1, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Now if you have a King James copy, you'll see the words there is in italics, which means they're not in the original. So if you read it, as it was in the original and was reflected in the King James. It reads, the fool hath said in his heart, No, God! No, no, no! That's what it's saying. That's the mark of a fool. And a fool is going to say no to the way of God. Two texts in closing. As I Reflect that in my own heart, but for the grace of God, I am a fool who will say no directly or indirectly in a countless number of self-deceiving ways to the way that is God's. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. This is an underliner, in my opinion. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless you fail the test? One of the things about the way of Jesus Christ is to be careful that we don't think we stand lest we fall. One of the ways of God is to point out to us that we still have the residual mother of all sin in our hearts, such as pride, that we have the capacity to deceive ourselves to thinking we're on the way to heaven when we're on the way to hell. And so one of the marks, I believe, of a godly, humble believer is far from a rebellious response to this command, a willing response to search our hearts from time to time and see if we are in the way, if we understand the way, if we love the way, and if we have embraced it as life itself that leads us to the Father, even the person of Jesus Christ himself. I close by reading Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. I trust you know it well, many of you by heart. Therefore, since we have a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, referring to the heroes of the faith in chapter 11, let us also lay aside every encumbrance, that's part of the way, and the sin which so easily entangles us, that's part of the way, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, that's an element of the way, fixing our eyes on Jesus, that's the heart of the way, the author and finisher of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
And that's the glorious consummation of the way where Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father is interceding for us and will have us in submission as we throw our crowns at his feet for eternity if we are in the way, N-O-W. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we know that we are so inclined to revert to self in every conceivable way and circumstance, but for your restraining grace. We admit we are feeble sheep, and we ask you to grant us hearts that resonate in every respect with Jesus Christ as the way to all truth, the truth himself, the life eternal, and the way to the Father. We ask you, Lord God, to make us passionate lovers of Jesus Christ as the great I am the way. We ask this in his holy, precious, priceless name. Amen.